look at okay what is your organizational or individual purpose if you're working as an activist as an independent activist think about what is the purpose what is the overall vision uh, that you have then in this particular context what is it that you want to change what is that shift in narrative uh, that you want to create and then think about if that shift has happened if that call to action has been accepted uh, what would that change look like so start reflecting on these questions first um and then comes to the nitty gritties of asking those smaller specific but very important questions uh, and personally i'm a big believer in asking questions especially if you are a comms professional um i would recommend uh, that you reflect on these questions to strengthen your narrative building and the story that you want to tell uh, so first question is who are we talking to this is this is i would say one of the most critical questions right after your purpose right so understand your audience you can't make people empathize if you don't understand what motivates them uh, what are their issues uh, what are the things that they they can they would empathize with more uh, so put in effort, put in efforts to understand your audience deeply understand their struggles what do you think would make them happy what would motivate them so invest some time there next question comes what are the values and aspirations you have in common with them don't focus on what people should think about the issues that you want to drive change on but on the values and aspirations that you want uh, them to share with you like for animal welfare i imagine that those values that can make your appeal stronger are fairer societies prosperity for all no suffering so think of it think of your issue from a value lens and what would relate to your audience better uh then what do you want your audience to do based on those values now here comes the call to action what is your call to action what do you want them to change uh, once they have sat through uh, your message listened to your message watched your video so then comes the call to action and fourth it is a very important thing i would recommend thinking about it right at the beginning that how would you measure success now your narrative building is only as strong as its impact so right in the beginning think about what would success look like just one i mean when you are talking about success just one caveat don't talk about activities but look at the outcomes uh, don't say that okay these many emailers are sent and that is how we will measure success what has happened after sending those emails how many people have signed up so you know look at it from a, uh, from an outcome perspective to measure the success not the activities uh, moving along so once you have identified the narrative i want to recommend you know packaging your content using the pack model uh, it is not something you won't already be thinking about but in my experience when i use this model it may, like helps me make sure that i have covered all my bases uh, it's very simple purpose audience channels and key messages purpose is a lot about the questions we have already discussed in the narrative building part what do you stand for the shift in narrative that you want to create what would you celebrate as a win so that comes in the purpose part then audience uh, again audience is where you should invest you know please uh, consider investing some time in there try to specify your audience as clearly as possible what is their geography what is their gender what is their age group what are the language they would speak or understand would they already have some knowledge about the animal welfare work that you are involved in uh, are they fencers are they early uh, adapters so just think about those questions because these answers to these questions will add to the second part of your pack model uh, which are channels and key messages now in channels uh, i imagine in today's world we will not be looking at one channel we will be looking at a multi channel integrated communications campaign so identify the best way to reach your audience now you know who your audience is so you can now identify where your audience is going to be present uh, if you are looking at multiple channels still think about which one would be the more primary channel which are the complementary channels how would you like to customize your message as per the channels so just think about that um and then the key messages part uh i feel this is where uh, many of us make mistakes we think about communicating everything because we are so passionate about the work that we are doing and rightly so we want our audience to know the every little detail or every important message that is out there uh but more often than not that negates the purpose of communications altogether focus on three key messages three is the golden number that you should follow there is enough research that uh, says that people cannot retain more than three key messages when they are exposed to a communication once uh, so 
three is the number you should follow. And if you are confused which three to choose, I would say think about what would work for your identified audience. If you're talking to corporates or businesses, make, maybe making a case for profits, for numbers would work better. If you're talking to young professionals or teenagers, longevity of our systems, sustainability of, of a planet, that appeal would work better. So just customize, choose your key messages as per the audience. Now, once you have identified the key messages, it is important that they are understandable because we are working in our, we have been working in our sector for years. We talk amongst each other. We are comfortable using the jargons, but those jargons should not land up in your external facing communications. Simplify your message, use those simplest of the language that you want to use there. Um, and here in key messages, I want to spend uh, some time talking about storytelling uh, because it's in key messages where you can find, um, make room for the stories that you want to tell. Uh, storytelling, I believe storytelling is the real hero. I read this somewhere that facts prove, but stories move. Uh, stories are part of every culture. Great stories are relevant for the people who are listening to them. They are engaging, they're empathetic and they are sticky, they stick with you. Uh, I'll talk about sticky a little bit towards the end of the presentation. Now, as uh, you know, development professionals, you can talk about a story that highlights a chain challenge, that highlights a solution, uh, that demonstrates impact. So these are some situations where I anticipate you could integrate storytelling in your communications. Now, all good stories have a few key elements. This is something which we have been uh, you know, the kind of stories that we have been listening to, we have been hearing or reading, these are the key elements which are present in every story. There is a central question. Uh, the audience must be clear what that question is. It must be a question that they care about. Uh, then comes tension, then comes the context. What, uh, how does that uh, question affect people or characters involved in that story? Uh, then climax is where the uh, key question is answered. Climax is where the key question is answered. And Resolution is how it gets impacted in the, in the story. Now, how does that look visually? This is the classic uh, story arc that you know we have seen. There has been enough research to say that if stories are told in these manners, in, in this particular art format, uh, they become most enjoyable and engaging for the audience. Uh, but, and like, you know, it is, but it is easier to follow this arc when we are writing fiction. Uh, when we have more creative liberty, but for the kind of work that we do as development professionals, it could be a little complicated to follow this conventional story arc. I would still recommend picking up a few key elements that we saw in the previous slide and adapt to uh, the work that we do. Uh, so this is a model that we're very simple, but it has been quite impactful, uh, you know, in the kind of work that for development professionals. Here, you modify the classic story arc. This is, these are the few elements that you can focus on. First, the opener part. This is the key question part. This is where you capture the audience's attention. You can start with a rhetorical question, share a shocking statistic, or start with an unexpected image that relates to the story. Uh, so once you have opened and set the context, then comes the connector part. This is where the bridge is built. This is where you give a little bit more context, little more about the situation or the characters or the um, you know people involved in that story. Then comes uh, key messages. Key messages is where you introduce, uh, you support your uh, you support your story with some facts, with some testimonials. So this is where you focus on key messages and then conclusion. Conclusion is a lot like connector. This is where you give audience some moment to breathe and integrate the message that you have written. And then you deliver the call to action and call to action can again go back to the opener, you know, completing that full circle. You can think of a punchy short message that uh, that would really drive the message home uh, to make sure. And it is something it would be nice if it is short and punchy so that people can remember it. Uh, so this is one version of, you know, modifying the classic arc that we could use as development uh, professionals in the animal welfare sector. Now, uh, I want you to, I want to recommend you to spend some time in finding a universal truth in your story. Now, what is a universal truth? Universal truth is what will make your story stick. Uh, there are, uh, on a deeper level of a powerful story, there are, there is always one universal truth that the story is exploring. Um, universal truth, as the name says, it is something that everyone would agree with. 
uh, these truths exist irrespective of culture, irrespective of countries, geography, the languages we speak, the kind of lives we have lived. Um, and here to, you know, to explain my point better, I will use the example of the movie Interstellar. I'm hoping uh, many of you would have watched this film, hence I'm using it as an example. A lot of my friends who are a bit, uh, you know, into science and mathematics, they don't really like when I use this example, uh, because here Interstellar has so many complications. It has like, you know, we are the earth is dying, we are moving to some other planet and there are uh, conversations about black hole, wormhole, time difference and whatnot. So there's so much happening in the story. But what one universal truth that the story explores is that a father has promised his daughter that he will return, that he will come back. And that is the universal story, you, the universal truth here. Now that truth you could that father could be going to another planet in another another galaxy or that father could be going to another country but the basic question is relatable it is true that bond of family is a universal truth which is true across family across cultures across contexts across geographies uh, some other examples of universal truth i would say are the underdog story uh, creativity has no language uh, where you come from doesn't matter but where you go so these these excuse me, these are the kind of universal truths, which if you will take the most popular or most appealing stories, uh, even the stories that we have heard as children, will have these universal truths. And that is what make the, make the story stick and work in different cultures and contexts. So try to find that uh, universal truth. If you can find it and integrate it to make your story appealing, it will help uh, make it stick uh, with your audience. Um, now I want to come to the advocacy part of this presentation. Um, I want to highlight that advocacy is a far broader cross-functional uh, effort and communication is one part of the advocacy. Advocacy involves multiple stakeholders and you know, there's a lot, lot needs to function to bring in that uh, change that we want to create using our advocacy efforts. But I want to talk about this one, just one example. Um, it is, using the example of this Ivory Lane campaign, which I imagine many of you would know. For others, uh, Ivory Lane was introduced in Singapore in August 2018 as a modern designer jewelry and accessories brand. And as expected, it was widely criticized by uh, netizens in Singapore. It was widely criticized by the media. There were many harsh reviews of the brand. Now, to counter this, uh, this you know, negative feedback uh, that the, excuse me, that the brand received, Ivory Lane uh, released a statement. And in that statement, they spoke about, they acknowledged the criticism and they talked about the legality of their business. They said that, uh, you know, at that time, Singapore allowed the important uh, imp uh, import of vintage ivory. And by vintage, they meant uh, ivory before 1990. Ivory Lane claimed that all products that they are selling on their platform are legally procured and produced. This, as expected, drew people's attention to the to this legal loophole in Singapore's law, and obviously the outrage become even more heightened. Come next day, in less than 24 hours, WW of Singapore released a statement saying that Ivory Lane is a fictitious brand that they created to highlight the shortcomings of the wildlife law in Singapore. Uh, Ivory Lane does not own or sell any ivory products, and as you can expect, there was like even the people who didn't know about the campaign at that time, after WWF Singapore statement, even many more people got interested in this issue. It uh, generated a lot of interest from the media and uh, citizens of Singapore. Obviously, there was a bit of backlash because, you know, some people accused WWF Singapore of using tricks uh, to engage with the audience, so things like that. But, but the long-term result was in one year later, Singapore banned the sale of ivory and all ivory products, irrespective of vintage or when that uh, I, I, when that ivory was imported in the country. Uh, WWF release leadership of WWF Singapore released a statement talking about how it has the potential of being the strictest ban uh, globally. Uh, I heard about this campaign uh, from Mr. Sudhanshu Sarunwala. He was the former executive director of communications and marketing there. And he said they uh, thought of releasing the, revealing that WWF Singapore is behind it a week after the, uh, you know, the first statement was released. But there was such interest and such backlash that they received that they had to uh, re reveal in 24 hours that it was actually a WWF Singapore initiative. And I think that shows the power of this campaign and how engaging it was. 
Now let's spend a few minutes in, in packing the ivory lane campaign using the pack model that we uh, you know discussed earlier. So again, what is the purpose? The purpose was extremely clear. It was not about anything else. It was just clearly about changing the law linked to the sale of ivory products. Uh, then audience, the audience, they were clear because they created a Facebook page. They knew that the audience that they're engaging with were digitally active. Now for Singapore, it is easier because almost 90% of their users are on, are on social media. So it becomes easy for a country like Singapore where, they're, where the internet penetration is so high. Uh, in channel, they identified Facebook. In 2018, I'm assuming Facebook would be far more popular there in Singapore. Uh, then obviously media engagement was used as a tool to you know, amplify the message. So Facebook was your primary uh, platform and media was used to support the kind of work that was done on, on Facebook. Uh, coming to K, only one key message, that was the loophole, loophole in the law. And uh, what I would recommend is if you have not read these letters, these letters are available on their Facebook page, go and read the language. It is so simply written in such clear, direct language. And it becomes, and it is brief, it is simple. So it becomes engaging for people to read until the end. And now if we reflect, let's reflect on this example from a story arc perspective, they introduced the conflict with a strong book, the kind of images that they used on the, on the page that they were sort of like luxury uh, products of ivory that really enraged people and rightly so. And then there was the climax part where it was re uh, revealed that it was a WWF Singapore initiative and then comes came, came the resolution a year later. Now, just I this is my last slide. I want to talk a little bit about the things that we should not do as communications professional. I think communication and storytelling is also a lot about what not to do. Uh, so one is make sure that your campaign and narrative falls, uh, uh, you know, as part of your overall branding and communication strategy. It should not be a standalone product. Uh, don't overwhelm people with numbers. This, you know, we have all been uh, culprit of. I think uh, we all do it in our work, but try to only put the most relevant numbers, make your numbers more, more relatable uh, rather than keeping them in thousands and things like that, make them more relatable. Um, again, don't assume the habits or notions of your audience. Try spending some time with your audience, even if you can do a few focus group discussions, if you don't have a lot of resources to do surveys, doing phone calls with people, talking to people, people who have already run such campaigns. So invest time in understanding your audience and don't stop and start. So it was the old style of communication where it was like, uh, you know, it was just waterfall, like one, it will just come from top down. The new style is waves. Uh, we dialogue, we listen, we co-create, we adjust our campaign, we come out again, we try to be compassionate, we try to be credible in our work. So try to follow that, you know, the waves model of communication here. Uh, on that note, I will end my presentation. Over to you, Sarita. Thank you so much. Thank you, Disha. That was very enlightening. And um, with that, I would in introduce our another speaker. We have Marion McDonald. And Marion is the executive director of Animals Out Cherwa. She has been advocating for animals for more than three decades. She campaigned against animal experiments, fox hunting, and recreational fishing, and eventually narrowed her focus to farmed animals. Based in New Zealand for more than 20 years, Marion formed Animals of Jerwa at the start of 2021 to achieve better lives for chickens, bred for meat. So Marion, with that, I welcome you and over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much, Sarita. Um, now let me try the technology, see how it goes. <laughs> And let's see. Now, can you see my screen saying three tips for effective messaging? Yes. Brilliant. Thanks so much. And so um, basically, I learned a lot about how the mind works and how language affects communication when I studied NLP, which is Neuro linguistic programming, which is a bit of a mouthful, and also hypnotherapy. So, today, what I want to do is give you three tips for creating messaging that can effectively communicate the ideas that you want to get across in your work for animals. Um, as you, I missed the beginning, but um, the, the
these slides will be available if you wanted to have another look at them later, um, because I'll be sharing some links to resources at the end. Do you ever feel like this? You know, like you've been sort of clear in what you've said, but the other person just didn't get it. I and mean, we might think that that's the audience's problem. That, you know, they don't understand our message in the way we meant it. But the thing is, communications only effective when the message is successfully received by your audience. Now, have a look at this. What do you see? Some people see the black outline of uh, two people's faces and other people see white, uh, whether it's a candlestick or a vase. Because if there's no context or framing provided, people will interpret things in different ways. And that um, applies to both images like this and to the words that we use. So if the word chickens was mentioned to various people, they might, for instance, think chickens exist to lay eggs or chickens are meant for meat um, because it tastes nice. Or they might think chickens are sentient animals who deserve a good life. And it's really up to us to frame our issue, to get people to think about it, well, encourage them to think about it in the way we want them to. So my first tip is avoid using your opponent's messaging. You want to avoid how they're framing the issue. Um, so, for example, from that previous slide, um, we wouldn't want to be repeating the the message that you know chickens just exist to lay eggs because that's not a helpful frame um, or a message to help animals the thing is the reason it's so important to avoid your the opponent's messaging is because the more something's repeated the more people are likely to remember it so you should say what you want and not what you don't want so for instance say chickens are sentient animals who deserve a good life so we want to avoid what's called myth busting, which you've probably heard of, but it's it's when you repeat the opponent's message and then explain why it's wrong. Because the trouble with this is that the subconscious mind remembers um, you know, the topic, especially if it's written in the headline, but they don't, you know, your mind doesn't necessarily remember the explanation of why it isn't true. So an example, this chicken industry article um, shows why not to do myth busting. Um, it uses the, the sorts of things that animal advocates might say with what they think of as a myth repeated in the headlines. So they're saying myth one, chickens are all drugged up. Um, and they're saying poultry litters, a waste product and poultry farms are a major source of pollution. And then they're also saying Chickens are given hormones to make them grow rapidly to large sizes. Now, I mean, when I read those headlines, it reminds me of the actual problems of the chicken industry. And because uh, those statements in the headlines are the most memorable part of the article, you know, especially if, if a reader's just skimming the, the, the article, I mean, that's really good for us because that's basically repeating that what the truth is, what the facts are about the chicken industry. And it's even better, they've put them sort of in blue, so they really stand out. So that's good for us. But the problem is that we do myth busting sometimes on our side as well. I mean, this is one, you won't be able to read the, the detail, uh, but it's on a website of an animal welfare organisation. They are repeating the opposition's messaging with the, the myth repeated in the headlines. So they're saying dairy cows produce milk all the time which obviously they don't because they have to have a baby to do that. Uh, female chickens lay eggs and the males get raised for meat. That's quite a common myth that there is around. But again, that's not true. They're completely different uh, types of chicken. And then chickens are bird brains. Absolutely not. Um, the trouble is these sort of myths, they sort of, um, it's what people might well remember in the future. Because, you know, the reader can understand at the time that what you're saying you know, isn't true, 
But what can happen is that over time they forget the sort of nuance, you know, the detail that you're giving, um, all the reasons that you've explained why it's not true. And some people will then just remember the thing that wasn't true, completely opposite of what you're wanting. And even more so, some studies have also found that some people think the thing's more likely to be true uh, because you've strengthened the idea in their mind. So those are all reasons why it's really important not to do myth busting. Now, let's try something. Don't think of an elephant. So what are you thinking of now? Could it be an elephant? And, you know, while I don't know exactly how you didn't think of an elephant, maybe you thought of an elephant, elephant in some way, and then you, know, you might put a cross through it in your mind or many other different ways that you can try not to think of an elephant. But the trouble is when you, you hear or you see something to make meaning of, you first have to make a, a representation of that thing in your mind. And in this case, it's an elephant. And then try not to think of it being there. But the trouble is your mind has already thought of an elephant, so that's still there. And research can show that um, people often forget about the don't. And the problem is talking about why this happens sort of technically, um, you've activated the same neural network. So that's a brain pathway for the concept that you've mentioned. So people are still thinking about an elephant. I mean, you don't necessarily need to know the detail of why it happens, but it's this is you know an explanation. Um, here's another example of a, a Facebook advert that was run by Jehovah's Witnesses. Have a look at this. So it says Jehovah's Witnesses is not a cult. And the thing is to, to sort of think about this statement, you have to think, first of all, what's, what is a cult? And then subconsciously, you've got that link in your mind between Jehovah's Witnesses and a cult. I mean, you may not, but most people do when they start to think of that sentence. And so in the future, if you're thinking about Jehovah's Witnesses, you might think about them being a cult. And, you know, that's because while you know consciously somebody reading that statement can know that they've said it's not a cult but the brain pathway of thinking about a cult has been activated so that advert that they're they're trying to get across this message um it just strengthens the idea and it makes it more likely that it's going to pop up in somebody's mind in the future when they think about Jehovah's Witnesses. So it would be a lot more useful for them to say something positive about what they are. So for instance, Jehovah's Witnesses is a faith-based community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is tip number two, avoid negation in your message. And it's it's really important to avoid negation in the message whenever you can because otherwise you can end up giving the, the very opposite message from what's intended. Let me give you another example. Uh, this is a banner that was used uh, many years ago at a protest in New Zealand. Um, what it says is possum fur is not ethical. And that negation effect is made even worse by the, the words is not being in red. Um, so it really stood out on the banner. And I mean, it would have been so much more useful to have said something like possum fur's cruel, straightforward, avoids the negation. Uh, here at Animals Out Terror, um, we worked, uh, as Sarita was saying at the beginning, we, we focus on chickens bred for meat. And what we do is to sort of, we're working to shift the chicken industry away from the abnormal, fast growing breeds towards healthier breeds that grow more naturally. So have a think about this statement. I don't support abnormally fast growing chickens. 
Well, because, you know, what I was saying about uh, the don't can be forgotten in a sentence, you can end up with actually communicating the message, I support abnormally fast-growing chickens. It would be a lot better to say something like, um, I support healthier, more naturally grown chickens. So you're saying what you want. Or you could say, I want better lives for chickens. Nice and simple. Okay. Now, my third tip for messaging, um, something I want to introduce you to, but it's something that perhaps will be more appropriate in some countries and in, in some cultures than others. And you can have a think about whether it's something that will work in your country. So the tip is uh, to make sure you mention who is causing the problem so that your audience can be really clear on who needs to act to solve the problem. Let me give you an example. So uh, here's a statement. Chickens are suffering from being crammed into sheds. That's fine. It explains that there's a problem. But have a look at this one. Meal kit whoop, that's a meal kit in New Zealand, is paying farmers to cram chickens into sheds, causing immense suffering. So the first statement, it just describes the problem. But the second one describes the problem. It describes you know, who is causing it, so whoop. And most importantly, you know, who can act to change it? So that's what this, this tip is all about, because it's uh, basically people or companies or it can be governments. They're the ones that create the problems that we're working to solve. And so we want to name the agent or the villain. Because the trouble is... Um, People often think that problems in our world are inevitable, you know, just not changeable. But when they realise that these problems are created by decisions that people have taken, um, you know, they can see that you know, different decisions can solve those problems and it really empowers people. So that's what makes this such an important technique. I mean, we really need to show clearly who's responsible. And then that puts pressure on the, the company or the individual that we've named. And it, it shows that the problem's created by a person and so it can be solved by a person. And when people understand that the problem is sort of person-made, it's easier for them to see and push for a person-made solution. And this ties into... You've probably heard the term theory of change of a campaign, uh, which is basically showing who needs to act and what steps need to be taken um, for, for the change to happen. So, you know, when X does Y, this will result in Z. So, for example, um, going back to that previous example, um, when WHOOP signs up to the better chicken commitment, chickens will have more space and better lives. Um, when your audience understands there's a sort of clear pathway for how change can happen, they can be a lot more motivated on how to act. Another thing that you can do to, to strengthen the message is by sort of phrasing the, the agent or the villain's action as a choice that they've made. So you could say uh, meal kit whoop is choosing to cause chickens to suffer by being crap by being crammed into sheds. Um, and sort of phrasing it as a choice, it means, you know, that that agent has got the choice not to do it. One thing uh, I was thinking that's a good idea, if you're thinking about um, incorporating this into your campaign messaging, it's also a good idea to, to check that there won't be any legal problems because naming an individual or company can cause problems in some countries. So just, just bear that in mind. But especially if you're worried that this isn't something that's really going to work um, in your culture um, or your country, you can also sort of turn it around and you can sort of encourage the agent to act. 
So, for example, we could say we know or we believe the head of company X cares about animal welfare. So we're calling on them to choose to commit to cage free eggs. So something to think about. Um, you know, is this something you think would work in your country? Um, do you think you'd get pushback from your supporters thinking it's sort of rude to single out a company or an individual? Um, would it perhaps work if you did it in an encouraging way rather than a sort of um, a negative way? Things to think about. So, uh, where did we get to? Right. Just to summarize um, those three tips. Avoid using the opposition's messaging. So say what you want, not what you, not what they're saying. Avoid negation when possible. And name the agent or the villain. And I would say this stuff takes practice. Um, I mean, I've written myth-busting pages in the past. Um, I've made lots of messaging mistakes and I will make them in the future. It's just keep learning, keep practicing, and we will all get better and better at messaging. So I'll just um, leave you with some uh, suggested resources if you want to find out more about this, uh, about language, communication, and messaging. Uh, there's an organization called Common Cause, and they've got a lot of free resources. So there's the, the link there, commoncause.com.au. There's uh, an amazing woman called Anat Shenka Osorio. She has presentations um, that really explain a lot of really useful points around good messaging. And if your organization perhaps wants to get training in this area, I'd really recommend uh, someone called Mark Chenery, who's from Common Cause Australia. And yeah, as I said at the beginning, you can access this PowerPoint to get the, the links. And if you've got any questions, um, ask them at the end. Thanks so much. Thank you, Marian. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, we now have our third speaker today, Shweta Su. And uh, a bit about Shweta, a passionate advocate for animal rights and welfare. Shweta brings 10 years of collective experience in strategy, networking, campaigning, management, communications and mobilization. She has led and grown food system networks across the globe and has spearheaded initiatives in animal rights and food systems at the intersection of climate change, global majority inclusion, partnership building and animal advocacy. She has previously served as a deputy director at India's largest federation for animal protection, FIAPO, and currently she heads the program division at 50 by 40. Thank you so much for being here, Shweta, and over to you for your presentation. Thank you so much for having me, Sarita. And this is a tough act to follow. We've had two wonderful presentations already. Uh, I'm just going to quickly start by sharing my screen. Um, just give me a minute. Hope everyone can see my screen. Then I can, if I can get a nod, I can just. Yeah, I can. I guess I can. All right. So, hi everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak on shifting narratives today. I think we've had uh, two wonderful uh, presentations already, and I wanted to maybe start by sharing a little bit about why I'm here and the perspective that I'm taking in today's conversation. So, I think as Sarita said, I've been around for about ten plus years. And I've worked in what I call the animal movement plus space. So going beyond just animal rights, but kind of exploring newer territories within that. Uh, my life has been a mix of communications as well as campaigns. And I think that is relevant to kind of share today because I think when we think about narrative building, and I think maybe Tisha kind of touched on this, it goes beyond being a communication tool. Uh, done well, narrative building can be the defining voice of your organization or your project, and that can lead the strategic planning for your work. So not vice versa. I think sometimes we think of communications as a tool, which it most certainly is, but it is also a strategy, especially narrative building is a strategy that we can use to define what we do. Um, in particular, when we speak about the social justice sector and when we talk about animal rights and animal welfare 
uh, I feel the success and failure of our campaigns rests very heavily on our ability to use these communication tools and communication tactics well. Uh, so whether it is for pressure building or whether it is for advocacy or whether it is for behavior change, how well we communicate our stories is pivotal to our success as a movement. And I'm taking a kind of practical uh, take on, on where we are today. So I think when we think about shifting narratives, uh, which was the topic that we started off with, and we have a view to how do we shift narratives, but I'm arguing first that within the animal rights, animal welfare sector, there is a need to shift uh, the narrative of how we talk and, and, and here's why. Um, roughly speaking, there are about 8 billion people on this planet right now, most of whom are employed in different sectors, IT, finance, development, coding, uh, business, you know. Um, and how many of these people do we think work in the social justice sector? Uh, I'm going to say a very, very small handful. Um, and I think when we think of the social justice sector, it is important to remember that that itself includes everything from water and sanitation, waste management, tobacco use, non-communicable diseases, health, road safety, and I'm not even touching the tip of the iceberg when I'm kind of talking about the social justice sector. Um, and where do we think animal rights activists or, an, or animal welfare falls within this? It's a very small number, and I'm going to guess something as a ratio of 1 is to 10,000. I'm guessing that's also liberal. Uh, so, so the number of people who are working on this or who are able to kind of drive this narrative are very small. Uh, and what ends up happening because of that is that animal rights and animal welfare as a concept, unfortunately, sits at the periphery of the periphery. So if social justice is a periphery to all these other occupations that we see. Within the social justice sector, we sit on the periphery of that, you know, so animal rights, you know, like we've all heard statements such as, hey, why do you work on animal rights? Why don't you work on like, you know, cancer or why don't you work for some other cause? So, so we're on the periphery of that periphery. Um, and I think we are twice removed from what is the current popular culture. And therefore, that somewhat limits our ability to kind of really engage with the audience that we need to engage with. Uh, by and large, people still believe that consumption of animal products is normal, natural, and necessary. And to be able to shift that narrative, we need to increase our relevance uh, within current cultures to be able to have long-term impact. Now, people who are in this room are probably uh, fairly experienced in, in the sector and might say, well, Shata, things have shifted over the years. And yes, they have. For sure, they have. Um, however, there is also a reality that all of us kind of live in small filter bubbles today. And while there is success and while there is progress, we might not be having the most fair idea of what that progress looks like. Um, and this is how it would really translate. So our messages and what we communicate may end up being an echo chamber because let's say I share something that works. To me, I think it works and I share it in my community. My community is my own filter bubble and they reinforce the idea that this, I, this, this campaign idea or this message that I'm sharing is an effective one. Uh, and so I end up believing that I have validation from my community that this works and there is some inter intersection and interconnectivity there. Therefore, this must largely work. And I think what that forms is that that gives us disparate ideas of shifts in the larger public sentiment, which we still, I guess, don't really see. Um, I can give an example of my own filter bubble uh, from the time when I used to do corporate engagement work, which is that I would be very sure that I'd go and walk into meetings talking about the profitability of this shift or, you know, what is the marketing value in dollars that you increase from positioning yourself as an eco-friendly or an animal-friendly brand. Um, and I would do that, but I think I was so deeply steeped in the animal rights, animal welfare uh, conversation, it was very hard to do justice to any argument, whether it was environment or health, and I would make those arguments, but I knew in my heart, and I would quickly kind of fall back to the animal argument as soon as I, you know, as soon as I had to. So my kind of call to everyone here is that we do need to kind of make a shift and mainstream this movement. We need to shift from an animal rights, animal welfare perspective to a food system perspective. And here's why. Um, many issues are, are single issues sometimes, you know, you solve one problem and that's amazing. 
but food itself is powerful in the fact that it is a unique silver bullet solution so it does affect almost any single issue that you could pick up and think of so whether you think of climate health economy human rights labor rights systems animals anything that you can think of you can find a way to to kind of bring it back to food systems so as it says food is the kick-ass ninja of change agents and by changing how we eat we can literally change the world and it gives you examples of what we mean by change the world if you think of climate change social justice diabetes anything in the world what happens when we link our story to this larger story of food systems is that we are able to lower the points of access and engagement for people so it allows a larger majority of people to be more accessible to our message in some ways and which leads us in turn to form like greater allies in the movement and forming greater allies across these different sectors, social justice, climate change, heart disease, diverse, you know, global power imbalances, biodiversity, is a game changer for, for our prim primary stakeholder, which is really farm animals. So that's the theory of like why we need to shift narratives and, and how. Uh, I also wanted to pivot a little bit now and share some broad, uh, I think I use this word, universal springboard ideas for what stories could be. Um, and when I say springboard ideas, what I really mean is you can contextualize these stories however you want to. Uh, these are stories that should be told and retold so that fit so that they fit and grow. They can, they are, they are like a place for you to jumpstart and they can take any shape. Um, you could launch your own campaign ideas out of those, out of these ideas. And I basically wanted to give you a taste of this. And this is an exercise that we had done with an external story guide and narrative building agency. So I hope this is helpful. I'm going to start by sharing like three stories. The first story that I wanted to share is that every single choice matters. So when we think about this story, this is the story of personal agency. Uh, it is a story that shows that your effects, your choices, every single choice has a cascading ripple effect uh, on society as a whole. So whether your choice is eating local, whether your choice is composting, or it is just more conscious consumption in terms of what you're consuming, all of these have a ripple effect on what happens around you. Um, the image here, as you can see with the woman in, in the middle, shows the different possibilities of what can happen with the choice. And you could put uh, that eat an apple in a dumpster and then it goes into a trash can, or you could really, you know, grow it and it could kind of, you know, create so many more apples uh, in, in the long run. So this is a story that really kind of holds at its heart and reinforces the idea that people have power and it inspires people to take action. Um, from a practical perspective, I think that every choice matters story would be powerful if you wanted to do a behavior change campaign, a digital behavior change campaign, or if you want to do some pressure building campaigns on corporates, or if you want to get petitions signed, it's a small ask, but the every choice matters messaging. And it doesn't have to be really these words. You can kind of, you know, play around with, with the idea, but that idea might be powerful for these particular campaigns from a, from a food systems perspective. Uh, so this just kind of repeats what I'm what I said, and I basically put this in so that when this is shared, this this information is there in the presentation as well. Um, the second story that I wanted to share, which is my personal favorite, is that everything is connected. Um, and Audre Lorde is a civil rights activist who says that there are no single issue struggles because we don't lead single issue lives. Uh, at any given point of time, we are not um, we are not just animal rights activists or animal welfare activists, we're also environmentalists, we're also feminists, we're also, you know, head of programs at 50 by 40, we're also daughters to our parents and, you know, so, and we have, we have like multiple kind of lives and multiple issue lives. So this story really builds upon the interconnection uh, that our actions, no matter how small, are interconnected in the larger, in the larger kind of scheme of things. Um, this would be really powerful if you want to kind of have a campaign that says that connects how, say, hunger in Sudan is linked to like the health of a child in Sweden and, and to kind of really build those connection points uh, through. It could also, I mean, and in this particular example, as you can see, it shows like that if a tiger like starts coming, like in the end of that diagram, it really shows how it has a ripple effect across uh, all of humanity and all of people and, and shows like the cascading effects of pandemics which is really true because 75 percent of all pandemics are uh zoonotic led um so so this could be a particularly like i mean one thing that i was thinking of when i was thinking of this campaign would be it would be interesting to do a power on your plate 
um, campaign with, with something like this with the integrated message. Um, this again can be really successful when we think of corporate campaigns because I think corporates often have like an idea of portraying themselves as you know, as people who are helping people, as people who are doing good for the society, but they are also, you know, in the background, often kind of, you know, cutting down forests, actively kind of pledging wars against like environmentalism, etc. So it might be interesting to do an everything is connected campaign in the sense of here's a true portrayal of what uh, is happening behind the scenes and then kind of use it as a brush building tactic. So this is a story of interconnection and interconnectivity. Um, the third story that I wanted to share with you is one of triumph. Uh, this is Greta Thunberg, as you probably recognized, and the story is really called Impossible Is a Dare. Um, and there are stories uh, every once in a while, I guess, uh, where we are surprised by the ability of human beings to triumph in the face of all odds. Uh, these are stories of inspiration and stories of hope, and they help us believe that given challenging times, we will be able to stand up um, and, and make decisions and change our behaviors for the better. Um, so hope is really the message. Hope and triumph is really the message of this story. And again, you can use the story to kind of mean different things for you. Um, so those were the three stories I wanted to share, personal agency, interconnectedness, and triumph and hope. So those are three broad universal themes on which we can base food system stories. Uh, so I hope that was exciting and interesting for you. Um, I wanted to quickly end by saying maybe those stories made sense. Maybe you felt that there was something that didn't add up for you. You maybe sparked something for you. Uh, if you feel that there's something more you want to discover, I find this what I call the storytelling sweet spot uh, toolkit to be really helpful, which is that if you want to see where your story should live, there's a very kind of, you know, you can do this like 10 minute exercise, which is which is to see what is it that you uniquely offer in terms of uh, you know whatever it is that you or your organization does what does the world truly really need and then within that what excites your primary stakeholder whether it is your partners your volunteers your audiences whoever else and it is in the intersection of these three where your story or, or as it says over here where the magic happens um, I'm going to end by a quote by Tony Morrison, really, uh, one of my favorite authors, is that if there's a book that you really want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must be the one to write it. So thank you. I hope that was helpful and enlightening, and I hope I didn't take too long. Uh, I'll pass it back to you, Thank you so much, Shweta. That was very interesting. And uh, now we have a couple of questions. So without further ado, I would like to pitch these questions to our speakers. So first question is for Disha. Um, someone anonymously asks, with so many questions using storytelling to sell their brand, and in many cases to just ask for donations, the stories are becoming very touchy and over emotional, at times repetitive too. Do you feel this method is becoming cliche? So Disha, this is for you. Thanks, Arita. I think it's a very important question, especially, uh, you know, as Shweta rightly pointed out, the universe of animal welfare is so small that our target audience and the people that we want to reach out to is already such a narrow uh, pool. So if we are repeating our messages, then, then it could become cliche. And to a certain extent, yes, uh, you know, the kind of emotional appeal that we use, it has uh, become cliche. Uh, so what I would recommend, especially when it comes to fundraising or uh, donation oriented campaigns, uh, there are two, three strategies I would recommend thinking about. One, don't think of it as a standalone campaign. Whatever campaign you're running, it is part of your overall organizational strategy. So if you are doing a campaign where you are asking for money, there should be another campaign where you are uh, celebrating the victories you know, talking about the shift that has happened, uh, bringing in more, uh, you know, empathetic uh, element or more humane element to the to the story where we are talking about the wins that have happened. See the people behind the curtains who are driving this change. So, a if you will complement it with those kind of campaigns, it will not be repetitive and it is not like we are reaching out to our audience always for asking money. Uh, so I think that would be nice. And even in those messages, you could add towards the end, like if you're interested to donate, you can. Second thing I would say, if we are using the, uh, the, the emotional appeal part of the you know, overall angle of the campaign, 
try to bring in a more co- like uh, like something like a very clear call to action something that sticks uh, like again it reminds me of uh, a wwf campaign by endangered emojis where instead of talking about animals they showed those emojis which will become uh, endangered soon so they are like bringing in elements which we all use in our day to day life uh, so i think it was a great way uh, to make it more appealing without talking about suffering or anything right in the face suffering is like talking about suffering i don't want to discount that element but we'll have to as communications professional we'll have to see how much of it can be exposed to the people where should we in, bring in some breathers where should we bring in uh, some elements of celebration as well some successes some wins as well so i think that could be an approach that we could take uh, for such campaigns thanks everyone thank you so much um and another question is for marian marian as uh, you've talked about negations and not using them so somebody's asked this question negation sometimes is used to avoid direct conflict and to make the message sound neutral not to attack you if we don't use negation what is the alternative for it um yeah so i was actually wondering if the person who wrote it could maybe just give an example um because i'm not sure quite what that would be um i don't know if they put that in the um so, um i think tan has asked the question but um uh, what they're trying to ask is um it is generally negations is used to avoid the direct conflict you um you know and and you do not want to in- offend but you want to sound a bit neutral so if not do that then what is the alternative um that we should go with so i can see um dan's put a an example in here keeping wildlife as pets is not ethical so that is negation um instead it's yeah saying keeping wildlife as pets is cruel yes yeah, so it's it's a lot more direct so i can understand in um some circumstances i can understand why um it might seem better to to do that to to use negation um sort of s- softens it um i mean the other way of looking at it would be is there another way of saying the same thing and using some different words so let me have a think um so you could say keeping wildlife as pets is something we're moving away from in our society um that sort of soft without blaming somebody and saying you're cruel um it's the thing with with these it's often playing around with how can we get the same idea across without using words that might give um the opposite effect by um setting off the the wrong idea or the opposition's messaging their framing um yeah it's often a, a way of sort of playing around with lots of different words and seeing what's going to give um the right answer without negation ideally but you can't always avoid it as well <laughs> that's a very long answer sorry <laughs> hope it makes some sense no it's wonderful thank you so much um you know in context to the same there is another question around that um somebody's asked Koshik Raghavan has asked, isn't messaging context specific? And this is again to you, Marian. Um, it says, once what we want to convey has been conveyed rather than myth bursting, for a belief change to happen is more information necessary that clearly helps to delineate what we think is correct and not correct, so that the audience can understand the nuances once they have taken the lead. Um, so yeah, so that's the question to you, Marian, from... I mean, messaging, I would say, is always context specific. And I mean, that's why your audience is very important. I mean, if you know your audience are already sort of along the same, going along the same direction as what you're explaining, a bit more information to them, it's there's going to be a lot easier to to um, bring them along even further to change those beliefs. but i think if you're putting out a general campaign message it's important that you don't repeat the the myth 
because, I mean, it's something that gets done all over the place, unfortunately, but it is really just reinforcing that same thing that's not true. And because it's um, activating that same bright brain pathway, people often forget that it's it's not true, as opposed to you've, you've said that this is what the true thing is. So certainly putting more information, you don't actually need to put the myth. I mean, it sometimes can feel like you want to say this isn't true. And it's because <laughs> it's such a natural thing to do. Uh, but or you can just a better way of doing it is just say this is what happens. This is the truth and go and go through that. Yeah. Hopefully that answers that question. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question for Shweta. So Shweta, you've talked about um, using narratives that aren't food. And two people have asked these questions. Um, one is anonymously asked, the example you gave was shifting narratives from animals to food. Wouldn't such shift neglect the present primary issues and tend to focus more on futuristic outcomes? Is there another question or do you want me to answer? Should I answer that? There is another question that's sort of linked to it, but maybe you can answer this first because that one talks more about animal rights. And right. I would almost, uh, I mean, it, it's controversial, but I would disagree that it would be future facing outcomes. I think we, there are a certain number of people we will capture when we have the animal rights messaging. There are people we will capture. Those are people who are probably very socially conscious, are probably very high on the chain of kind of morality and are able to shift behaviors through information. And that's a very, that's a handful of people. Even, I would say even people within the social justice sector make those calls. Like I might be, I'm very vegan, but I'll buy a second pair of jeans, even though I know it takes like four or 5,000 liters of water to create one, right? So even, so, so, so there's only so much of a change that would come when we speak about it from like a, um i guess morality or a or an animal rights first perspective how else can we lower the point of engagement for people that's what the argument really is how do i go to a government officer or how do i go to someone who's really interested to speak about health and doesn't really care about like animal rights or thinks it's okay to consume animals as as food how do we reach out to those larger people how do we use like i think these universal stories to increase our base and i think there was something that Kaushik touched upon in his last question, which is that once we've kind of got people, then what's the next step, right? And I think what we've often seen, so, so when you think of like motivations to shift, price, accessibility, and affordability and environment are like the top four, right? And then when you think of health, when you think of like, in, you know, like health and cost, yeah, health and kind of, you know, morality, those like are the bottom, bottom rungs of like why people kind of change behaviors. So if those are the top runs of why people change behaviors, the really interesting thing is once people change behaviors, then they often shift their tune to say, you know, I, I did this for health, but it's so amazing that it has animal welfare rights. Like it's, it's, it's easy to be moral once you've made the shift for other reasons. And of course the morality argument kind of comes in at a later stage. At that point of time, I think people go out looking for information themselves. So I would say it actually widens the movement. And as a second point of contact, you know, I think there's information out there that people seek out themselves. So I hope that answers that question. You want to ask me the second one, which is I don't know, similar. Yes, yes. It somewhere uh, is, um, you know, related to the first one also. So um, this question says, if a food systems approach is taken, how would priority be given to animal rights and welfare? There are so many pain points where animal rights and welfare and human issues are at larger heads and de facto human issues take precedence so yeah right so i think the way to think about it is yes currently human issues do take precedence in in so many cases how can we use that to our advantage so for example if you think of dairy in india right dairy in india is a big is a big study um everyone i think generally thinks well when we think of uh, the the ag movement in india it is important for us to kind of promote dairy because livelihoods depend on it right if you research a little further, you see the lives of people who have, in, you know, who have two to five cattle, like not the big dairy farms, which I think we can all easily agree are like, you know, everyone, it's, it's easy to say factory farming is bad. No one is making profits. There are, if, if we start researching kind of singular, like people who are keeping say two to five cattle, there is, there are no resources, even though the government is putting so much money in terms of kind of subsidies, they're still not able to make profits. It's a really hard job. Uh, it, 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 takes like there are case studies and I, I can share some articles that I've written on, on this. 
that even if you don't have food to eat, you have to feed your cow like 50 uh, whatever kgs of grain every day or fodder every day because that animal has to live because your sustenance depends on it. So can we take those stories? Can we take those human rights stories and use them to say, well, it's not even working at that level because it really isn't. Like, I think it's about how, again, it's about how the narrative has been framed. The narrative has been framed as it is important for smallholder farmers to have a, uh, to have livestock. That, that's, that, is, that is the story that we have. Really, it's not profitable for them as at all either, right? So can we amplify that story using the human rights first angle? And the animal angle does come in, you know, it, it does kind of follow through. So can we can we find those kind of gaps and linkages and be smart about it? I guess that's the that's the way that I think about it. Think of climate funding, like less than one percent of funds go into food systems right now at least like universally speaking at least by most conservative data 14.5 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions come from food systems why isn't 14.5 percent of climate funding going into into food systems and what sort of a game changer would it be given that the climate industry is like donates about like 500 billion plus a year like what would that mean you know and how do we kind of frame those linkages i think is the larger story yeah i i hope that was relevant Yes, thank you so much. Um, we do have come closer to the end of time. Um, I just want to take one more question which is for Disha. So Disha, this question says, I'm particularly interested in how to identify compelling openers for stories and also the tendency to want to include statistics, numbers, figures. Apparently, these are not what engage people, but for some of us, they are irresistible. Yeah. Thanks, Sarita. I think that's a very, very important question. And right hook will sail you through, right? You know, we know people's attention is only in the beginning of whatever campaign they're coming across or the video that they're watching or the article that they're reading. So right hook is where the magic should happen. A lot of times what we do as you know, this is something which we have also seen now in our films that we have grown up watching and everything, the stories that we have seen, that there is a big reveal towards the end and where we want to like make the most important revelation. I feel we should get away from that narrative, especially in today's world when we are living and thriving on social media, people's uh, attention span is so small. We should bring our most important message to the beginning. Don't wait for the end because there is a high probability a good part of your audience will not reach until the end. So first thing for the hook is start with your most important message. Don't make people wait. So if there is some uh, for a good hook, you could use a shocking fact, which people may not be expecting, or you could maybe humanize it quickly, remove, remove all the, you know, irrelevant material in the beginning and start with maybe like one particular human story or start with a shocking fact, start with an image which people are not expecting. And when it comes to facts, I would say don't, I'm not saying not to use facts, not sorry, figures. I'm saying uh, use less of them. Don't overwhelm people with numbers. People, numbers are overwhelming if we are not truly invested in that issue or if we are not like majority of us are not statisticians or mathematicians, so it becomes difficult. Keep your num like keep one or two numbers, don't overwhelm with them. Uh, then what can you do with your numbers? You can tell your numbers slightly better. Instead of saying, um, you know, 30% of the women suffer violence, domestic violence, say one in uh, one in three women suffer domestic violence. What, what can you do to make it relatable? So just simplify the number and don't put too many numbers. So that's how would I would say uh, to how to use figures and numbers in your co communications. Thank you so much. And thanks to all three of you for taking your time out for doing this session and for the wonderful presentations and answers that you've given today. We've come to the end of the session. And I would also thank all of the attendees here and all other platforms. Thank you for joining. And I hope you enjoyed the session. Over to you, Dan. Yes, oh, just thank you, Sarita, and yeah, just um, just to, to repeat your message. Thank you, everyone, for joining the session, and it's a great session, as you can see, in the, a lot of answers and interest. Thank you very much, and looking forward to, forward to seeing you all in the next one. Bye-bye.